Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. This is a part two podcast. If you haven't listened to the previous one, we talked about this concept of, we actually kind of went meta on the concept of marketing and how our relationship with marketing sort of reveals our understanding of what the purpose of it is and reveals our under, you know, our relationship with our willpower. It's a pretty interesting podcast. However, the original intent of it was to talk about how types can be marketed to or the different ways to communicate to different personality types in order to give them a message. And so if you haven't listened to the first podcast, I I do recommend going and checking it out, but it's not completely necessary to listen to the second podcast. And this one is going to be on utilizing an understanding of people's wiring or what's technically technically called our cognitive functions in order to better communicate a message in a way that makes sense to these different personality types. So this comes off of a program we've actually developed here in-house that is on our website called Rapid Customer Rapport, which is a, a much deeper dive into what we're going to talk about on this podcast. And one of the things we like to do when we create a program, we obviously put a lot of effort into all the different nuances of the things we talk about, right? We go really deep. We talk about all the different places to apply it. And that's what the program is. We spend a lot of hours putting programs together for that reason. But we also realize that not everybody's at the same place. Some people aren't ready for certain programs or offerings that we have here at Personality Hacker. Some people just aren't ready to invest in them or whatever, whatever reason... Rapid Customer Report may not be a program you're ready for right now. So what we like to do is bring elements from the program that are really high leverage that you can then take and implement regardless of your investment in the program. And and we like to do that because we realize we have a large audience that's developing and growing every day, and we want to genuinely help the world and bring people up to different different levels. Now, we do have programs that help us do what we do best and keep us going, doing what we do with a value turned back. But we want to give value freely here on this podcast regardless of that. Now, this, this stuff we're going to talk about here is very powerful. In fact, we've been invited to come and speak in front of different conferences and talk about this in different levels because communication with the different personality types and speaking to people in a language that makes sense to how their mind is wired, those cognitive functions, is extremely powerful for persuasion, for you know getting people to act, for encouraging people for behavior change or thought change. It's very powerful. And one of the things that we're always really careful about is who we partner with and who we give this information to. Because in the, I think some a little bit of information can be dangerous. So what you hear today is not a full and complete picture, but it is enough to where you can use it in your life, I think, when you're talking with somebody, just communicating with a, a spouse, a lover, a friend, a child. I mean, it can be really helpful in your communication strategies. And also it can be applied to business or commerce or nonprofits or whatever else if you're trying to get a message out. And that's kind of the frame we're going to come from today is more of an institutionalized use of it. When you're writing something in print or you're creating a video or an audio, putting things in a way that really hits the listener or the watcher or the reader to where they go, okay, I get it. I understand. And they can take action against that. So that's really what we're going to unpack today in this podcast specifically. Yeah. Marketing is effectively communication from one person or one business or a small group of people broadcasted out to a large group of people. So that's how we're using marketing. That's basically our definition. Anytime you've got a message that you're trying to broadcast to a large group of people, you are marketing effectively. It doesn't have to be in a business. Like Joel mentioned, there are a lot of different contexts for marketing, but that's basically, it's that's the difference between say marketing and sales. Sales is one-to-one. You are directly engaging with the person who may or may not be become an end user. But marketing is more of a sort of a um, just kind of a, a push out to an indiscriminate number of people. And yeah. your point in marketing is to try to find the people through these broadcasts that are your core audience, the people who would be attracted to what you have to offer, regardless of what that context is. You're looking for, you're trying to send a message in a bottle almost or kind of do a whistle that the people who who are your demographic and are are relevant to the offerings you have will be able to hear that message and then sort of turn their attention to you to get more information from you. So marketing to different personality types means that generally what you have to start out with is who are you marketing to? Like who is the avatar or the person that you're attempting to attract their attention? And with a lot of different products and, you know, basically programs or whatever it is you're trying to sell, 
a lot of times people say, I don't have an avatar. I'm just trying to sell it to everybody. <laughs> but that's not exact. That's pretty much never true unless you're like selling soap, right? Like soap is 100% universal. Hippies won't buy it. Yeah, but <laughs> maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. Modern day hippies seem a lot cleaner than <laughs> one time. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's like with with very few exceptions, there there are certain things that are universal products but most products aren't. Most products have a an audience of people that are particularly going to be interested in that product. And so the first thing you have to do when you're marketing to different personality types is figure out who is your audience, who is the person that you're attempting to get the attention of and attract them. And then you can craft messages to that person. Generally, the best products and programs and the things that you can sell are, are something that solves a problem solves a challenge. And so one of the marketing principles that I, I think is probably my favorite marketing principle that I picked up from um, effectively the only person who's been like truly my marketing mentor other than Joel. Um, he said, if you can articulate somebody's problem to them better than they can, they unconsciously ascribe to you the solution. Because most people have tra- problems and challenges that they can't even put into words. It's one of the reasons why it goes unsolved. And so most of the time we're trying to sell to somebody or attract somebody towards something that is a solution to a problem or a challenge. So getting super good at articulating what that person's problem or challenge is, is the first step in building a relationship with them. They'll start paying attention to you because if you can understand what the problem is on that level, then that means that you probably have worked out the solution as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't be talking about it with them in a marketing style. Yeah, and you can see like companies using challenges to solve as a way. So let's say a gum manufacturer, chewing gum. There's a company that says, we want to manufacture chewing gum, and now we got to figure out what problem does this solve? And so a marketing agency tries to invent a problem or a challenge, and they try to come up with a demographic and stuff. This is just an illustrative story I'm giving you. Uh, you know, they, they look at a, a chewing gum and they go, okay, what can we do? Okay, young people are in a dating and mating time period of their life. They are looking for the person they may want to connect with and be with for the rest of their life. So let's target on young people and let's target it on having fresh breath to be desirable to the opposite sex. That's going to be our problem or challenge we're solving. And now they connect a product and they try to find a problem or challenge and they connect the two and now they present it in a commercial, for example. Maybe there's uh, a newly introduced couple of a man and a woman that are kind of attracted to each other, a young man and woman, and one has bad breath. And then if they eat the gum, the bad breath is solved. Now they have the, the woman in their life and they're happily ever after, right? This is basic marketing 101. This is, the, this is what's happening all the time is good marketers are trying to find... Usually what's happening is a company produces something and they're trying to find a problem that this thing that they produced could solve. And again, in, if you listen to the last podcast, I think this is the schism... Uh, between good and bad marketing. I think this is the breakdown of why people are so hostile toward marketing because they can almost sniff this out. They realize, oh, you didn't go from the challenge I had in my life and you created a product to solve my challenge. You created this thing out here that you want to try to get to me. So you're manufacturing a problem on my side and projecting it onto me or trying to illustrate it to me. And I feel manipulated here. I feel pushed towards something that I don't even necessarily have a challenge in my life around. This is all, this is all for you, isn't it? This isn't for me. This doesn't actually help me this is you trying to create a problem in me so that I feel like you're helping me. And like, think about makeup. Women's makeup companies do this all the time. They project this image of what beauty is supposed to look like. They get you to feel bad about yourself. And they say, aha, we have the solution. This makeup that we've created will make you feel beautiful. It'll make you feel the way you want to feel. It'll attract the people you want to attract. It'll attract the lover you want to attract. This is the solution to your problem, which you didn't have when you were four. You didn't think about it when you are four years old. You didn't have the problem. When you're four, they manufactured a problem. And again, this is where I think marketing gets this smarmy name. It gets this hostility to it because this is what's happening. Problems are synthetically being created that aren't genuine. Well, or there is a genuine problem, but that is not the product that will be solving that. Like well, yeah. the, the recent outcry over a Pepsi commercial <laughs> where like there's legit a lot of socioeconomic and like the, the different humongous problems that are being expressed in like lines of policemen in some sort of protest, which is a massive, massive issue in the United States or has been for a little while. 
And then the suggestion in the Pepsi commercial, and they got a massive backlash, was that like Pepsi would make everything okay. Yeah. It's like, okay, Pepsi, you might have overstepped a little bit (laughs) saying that a carbonated sugary beverage is somehow going to be the solution to like these horrible culture clashes. So uh, sometimes... marketers don't do a very good job they they try to capitalize on current problems and then make some sort of connection between the two and you can see why pepsi or another company you know like a a soda company would do that because soda doesn't solve a problem in fact soda creates problems so you can see that they're having trouble attempting to solve challenges traditionally they've just done with thirst right like you're thirsty so go drink a soda which also doesn't solve that problem but okay <laughs> right <laughs> and and the, that's why the word thirst and refreshing and pepsi has or excuse me dr pepper tried to do this by making it so that you're choosing dr pepper and not one of the two primary sodas like coke and pepsi so therefore drinking dr pepper makes you an individual and so the the problem that they're trying to solve is one of following the herd and individuality but that also to some extent like rings hollow even though that is you know that's a legitimate way of attempting to market it also rings hollow because it's like really are you an individual because you're drinking you know a prune based sugary carbonated beverage as opposed to a like you know caramel based based, or whatever (laughs) so there there are definitely over you know there's like overreaching that happens in marketing that feels really kind of synthetic and icky and we just i guess because we're so used to being marketed in those ways we just forgive it or we don't we get outraged and you know we write something on twitter so i think the antidote to that is is people who make things instead of outsourcing their marketing it needs to be integrated and we talked about this in the last podcast I think the solution is stop stop having a schism here. Stop seeing yourself as a creator that then you hand over to a marketing arm or you hire an ad agency. I mean, I'm talking in the high level here, right? Abstract. Become your own messenger for the thing that you create. So I believe that Pepsi, this is, this is my belief, that Pepsi needs to bring that in-house. Why are you creating this? Now, ultimately, Pepsi and all these other companies that are creating these sugary drinks are just, they've just decided we want to create this and make money from it. There actually is no benefit. It doesn't add value to the world. The sugar in it causes brain damage and causes obesity and all sorts of other problems. It just feels good to drink it. We like the sugary taste on our mouth. So it's basically entertainment, really, is what they're selling. They're selling entertainment in the form of a physical drink. That's really what's going on here. So I believe it would be very difficult to get that message out in a congruent way because the product itself is incongruent. There's really no value it adds except for entertainment of the tongue. That's it. The taste buds are entertained for a short period of time. The rest is just garbage for you. And so it's going to be really hard for people to bring... If you're creating crap product, it's going to be hard for you to have an integrated message of promoting that product. And I think that, again, is where that schism happens, is people that create crap try to window dress it and make it seem like it's not. But it is. It's just garbage. And this is where you as a creator... If you're listening and you're an artist, you're a creator, you're a writer, a speaker, maybe a coach, maybe you do something like podcasting, who knows... Stand behind your your creation and become the messenger for it. So that's, again, we talked about all this in the last podcast. So I think a part of marketing too is getting, uh, is really having your finger on the pulse of the savviness of your audience as well. Because I was just thinking, you know, Coke doesn't attempt to do this. Coke, Coke like does brand advertising where they've got some polar bears. And so they don't even pretend to try to say that they're solving problems, you know, like they just they have these polar bears and the polar bears drink Coke and then like Coke has its advertisement. But then I thought I I was remembering the old Coke commercials back in like the late 60s, early 70s, where they like sang the song about giving the world a Coke and insinuating that somehow giving the world a Coke would like, you know, solve world problems you know, conflict. It would bring world peace. So at the one point, Coke was making the exact same claim that Pepsi attempted to make not that long ago. But we're also in a time period where we're a lot more savvy about how things work. We're in the internet age. And we're not as innocent, I guess, around marketing messages. We don't have that sense of just buying into whatever's on TV because TV is a relatively new, you know, technology. And advertising is in this way is relatively new. Like we kind of, we suspend a lot of disbelief when something is a novelty. And we're no longer in a novelty time period. And so part of marketing isn't just knowing the personality types of the people you're marketing to, but also recognizing that they might have some insight. And you can't just, 
make a correlation that doesn't actually exist. You've got to be, like you mentioned, Joel, you have to be in integrity with the, with the product and with the message and with the person who's the end user and line all of that up before, like as you're crafting your message. Yeah. And also it's going to be more co-creative going forward. I envision a world that, and we've already seen this happen, how much, how much do companies and creators rely upon, let's say, social media and other things to co-create the message that people will receive. And really well-produced products and services, I believe, that own their promotion, learn how to co-create an experience where the person that's ultimately going to benefit from this creation is part of the messaging. Like They bring them in to say, okay, how would this be best, not only articulated to you, but help us improve the product to actually serve the needs that you have. Help us figure out how we can make this thing be the best it can be to solve your problems or to entertain you in the way you want to be entertained or whatever that would be. It's a co-creative process. And so again, it's this this it's shifting fast. And I think companies that that get this will be able to take they'll be able to make better creations, first of all. And they're not gonna create stupid crappy sugar water and try to push it out on us like garbage. And they're also going to they're going to make better products and services, and they're going to have a better way of co-creating the communication to get those products and services into the hands of people that will actually benefit. So I see a really, I actually see a lot of positivity coming. And I think this, this storm of messaging and advertising and marketing and all these messages flying at us, I believe this is like a death rattle of an old way of doing things. The new way is going to be the creator is much more in touch with their audience. They're much more collaborative and co-creative with that. And they still don't apologize for deriving value from their creations. Just because they sell something doesn't make them bad or wrong. It's how they derive value back for the thing that they've produced in the world. That's just how the world works. You get value back for the things you put out that are valuable. And I think that's going to happen more and more and more going forward. Let's, unless you have any more to say, you want more to say on that, and then we can pivot into the actual cognitive function stuff. Well, I was actually going to pivot. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> I was going to do like this really elegant transition, but oh. you've already called it out. So, Well, just ignore what we all just said. Go for your elegant transition. Here we go. Yeah. Well, just to piggyback on what you mentioned too, I mean, I don't know how quickly that that marketing utopia is going to enter in. I think it's going to have to sooner rather than later in order to to acknowledge and recognize and account for the savviness. Like the, We just get marketing messages so often that we're at a place right now where we have no innocence around it. Like we are, we are jaded, like consumers of marketing. We have marketing literally everywhere. So we're at a place right now where like it's going to have to change in order to account for the fact that we, we are no longer going to, you know, suspend disbelief or give marketing the benefit of the doubt, which is one of the reasons why people get so like creeped out about it. The truth is though, that if there was no marketing and there was no sales of products, there would be like literally no business. Like nobody would have a job. You would have no job to go into if marketing didn't exist because everybody's selling something and everybody sells something through marketing. So if you hate marketing, well, it's one of the backbones and bench, like the foundations of the entire economy that we, we exist in. <laughs> so Don't get rid of it, make it better. Yeah, exactly. Make it better. So even even with all of this high mindedness and this concept of like keeping your finger on the pulse of the the people you're you know the demographic that you're, you're attempting to talk to and of the age brackets and their savviness and recognizing that you need to be in alignment with the challenges that you're trying to solve for the end user with your product even that if the challenge is entertainment which is a perfectly acceptable challenge to solve right because we all need to be entertained as well so there's like lots of you know the the problem or challenge doesn't have to be something that's like world peace like it can simply be you know like I want to stay connected, so I'm gonna have a phone, right? Or I, you know, I I want to be entertained for a couple hours with a with a narrative or story, so I'm gonna go see a movie. Like all of these are valid, quote unquote, challenges to solve. They don't have to be world problems, but as long as you're in alignment with the challenges you're trying to solve, and you're not taking gross, overreaching, you know, ridiculous liberties, and um, then then you should be able to to talk to your audience pretty clearly. But you're still gonna to need to have a sense of communicating to them in a way that makes sense to them. This is very similar to the previous podcast where we've talked about the language that each type speaks and how our job is to not insist that people come and play in our sandbox, but our job is to go to their sandbox or at least at least meet them halfway in order to help them understand what you're trying to communicate to them. If you have if you are trying to communicate something to somebody and they cannot understand 
there is an adage that it is always on you to make it clearer. Now, I think that that's not always 100%, but you know, like accurate. Sometimes people simply don't understand because they've got a bias that won't allow them to understand. But you can't do anything about that bias. All you can do is get clearer in your communication. So as far as how we act, just pretend it's true. Just pretend 100% of the burden is on you as the communicator. And one of the best ways to reach people at that level is to understand how people's minds are wired. And when it comes to marketing, marketing is a form of persuasion. We're trying to get people to act. We're trying to get people to make a determination or evaluation that this is an important thing to do. So as far as we're concerned, one of the best things to know about your demographic is which judging or decision-making cognitive function the majority of them are using. And to speak in that language, use their judging or decision-making cognitive function, use that process to help craft your messaging so that you're going to their sandbox. There are four judging processes or judging cognitive functions. We also call them decision-making to make it a little less complicated. And if you want to get a breakdown of how cognitive functions work, go to the website, type in car model into the search engine and um, articles and podcasts will come up. So you can do some research on what that looks like. But assuming that you know what judging or decision-making cognitive functions are, there's four of them. And the 16 types, depending upon their personality type, will use one of the four as their primary way of evaluating the world or making decisions based on the information they've taken in. So when you're marketing, you are effectively talking to a person's cognitive functions. Now, you're you're talking to actually, if you want to get really technical, you're actually talking to their cognitive function judging polarity. <laughs> a polarity is the, uh, the grouping of two opposite functions. And so every single judging or decision-making process isn't clean all by itself. It's actually part of a polarity where its opposite function is influencing us just as much. However, we're not going to go too much of a deep dive into that. Just remember that if you know what your personality type or the personality type of the demographic, like the, the majority of the people who are your demographic, if you know what their functions are, remember that you're not just talking to the, the decision-making process that's either in the driver or the co-pilot seat. You're also talking to a portion of them that's in the back seat, the decision-making process that's sitting behind, because that is also part of our decision-making process. But let's just pretend that all four of them live in a vacuum and you're not talking to a polarity. Let's just take each one and give some principles about how you can speak to that decision-making process in a way that's persuasive to it. So the first uh, cognitive function that we'll mention is technically called extroverted thinking. We call it effectiveness and it is the decision-making process, the primary decision-making process of all TJs in the Myers-Briggs system. So INTJs, ISTJs, ENTJs, and ESTJs. All of them use extroverted thinking as their primary way of determining the value of something. And we've talked a, we've talked a little bit about this in previous podcasts, so feel free to get a deeper dive there. But basically the question that extroverted thinking is asking all the time is what works? They're always looking for ways to organize the outside world to accomplish an end game. So most of the time when they are seeking a product, they're looking for something that will help them accomplish tasks or goals or make their life easier. Now, that doesn't mean that they're always only looking for tools to be able to, you know, get big things done. That is a part of their evaluative criteria, but also there could be questions like, how do I relax? Or how do I find, you know, how how do I do better in a relationship because I'm having trouble there? Like it can be anything that is getting a, a, a goal accomplished or something, an end game that they're attempting to get accomplished. It's anything that's going to help facilitate that process. This puts a lot of focus on results. So extroverted thinking is interested in purchasing results. They would like to just have the result be able to be bought. In other words, it's not the tools to get the result. It's not even the process to get the result. It's not to learn how to get the result. I think this process in particular would just love to just buy the result, the end result. If it was possible to buy the end result, that's what they want to do. So as a great example of this, if you go on to any major airline here in the United States, often you'll have one of those airline magazines. And this is a really interesting exercise as you listen to this podcast, just to kind of do, start opening up magazines and try to figure out who they're mostly marketing to in a magazine. In-flight magazines often are marketing to the business person that's traveling on an airplane to one destination to another for a business meeting. That's what a lot of airlines sustain themselves on business travel. 
And often, at least in the past, and this is changing a lot now, often those were men that were traveling from location to location. And so if you open a lot of major magazines, you'll see a lot of advertisements for matchmaking services that are these long ads on a page that have you know a, a woman who says, I'm a matchmaker. I'll guarantee you the right match for you based on my services. Basically, you purchase my services and I'll deliver you a result, which is your soulmate, your lover, your spouse, whoever you want. I'll deliver that for a set of money. And so I'm giving you this marketing message to say, you want the result of love in your life? Have you had struggle with that? Do you not know how to talk to the opposite sex and get the result you want? Go ahead and give me value, give me money, and I will deliver a result to you, which is the romance that you so desire in your life. And that's really a very well-crafted extroverted thinking style of advertisement. Is that something that you still see in those magazines or is that something yeah. that was traditionally in ma- in those magazines? No, I, I saw one like a few months ago oh, okay. when I was flying. <laughs> no, they're still like literally in the back. And what's crazy is like I'm like ripping out ads out of these magazines and I always like to kind of catalog them for marketing, like marketing techniques that people use. And that I think is a really good illustration of, I mean, that's really zoomed in. Usually they're targeting extroverted thinking males or somebody that has extroverted thinking in their stack, that's really what those ads are targeting in spe- specifics. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think they probably have a high number of them that fly on airlines. So yeah, it's absolutely an ad you'll see in a magazine, at least here in the United States. I don't know about overseas. Yeah. Well, and I there's it's not so much that effectiveness or extroverted thinking is just looking for a pill to swallow necessarily, but they are looking for things that will make their life as easy as possible to get to an end result. So a lot of advertising toward extroverted thinking is also kind of, I don't want to say status oriented, but especially if it's going towards somebody who's trying to get, you know, a major project accomplished, one of the best ways to do that is through networking and through people believing that you're important. So extroverted thinking also has a tendency to 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 speak to status because status is, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I say that as somebody who's using introverted thinking and so status feels like a bad thing to me. I'm sure other people hear the word status and they don't automatically assume it's bad or need to make, you know, like I'm making bookended statements like that's not a bad thing. <laughs> Most people don't think status is a bad thing. Status is actually a good thing. It's, it's It helps you be influential. It helps you get things done. So a lot of extroverted thinking marketing also goes towards things like the nice car or the nice watch or anything that will help you get the impression you need in order to facilitate your goal goals being accomplished, like maybe in a business context, or it's things like, you know, leverage tools that will help you think clearer, or it's something that will help you lose weight faster, or like whatever it is that helps a person make that connection. Now, you don't have to give a lot of data to extroverted thinking. You just have to show results. Extroverted thinking is way, way, way more persuaded by results than it is by information, like pure information. They want to see that it works or it has, you know, it has value in a very like specific or concrete way. So most extroverted thinking comes with a lot of testimonials or a lot of before and after pictures or something that basically goes, this thing works and it's proven that it works by this. So if you're, if your core audience is filled with people who are using this process, you want to make sure that you add testimonials in there and you add before and after pictures and you, you show the result. The result is super clear in your marketing and that way that you'll attract them because that's what they're ultimately after is a result. You know, one of the things we can also be looking for here as we talk about this are the ways that goes badly or the missteps that could be made by either a person that is extroverted thinking or even somebody trying to market. So one of the things that can can go wrong here or maybe not be ideal here is just because it works doesn't mean it's necessarily the sustainable or the right solution. So if I let's say I was a uh, I I had a company for example that sold uh, phone systems right and I come to you as an extroverted thinking person and I say I can give you a result of less time for your employees to be answering the phones at, at your business and you can make more money and I show you on paper all those results and you put this phone system in and now there's not live people answering the phone on the other end that in fact in the short term probably did increase your profits and reduce your staff burden. But ultimately now, when your customers call in, they're not getting a live person on the end of that call. So it's much more efficient, but is it effective in the long run? And I think that's really the thing as you're looking to, you know, if you are extroverted thinking and you're looking at marketing messages, because I want to give you the, the other side of this, if you're extroverted thinking, 
realize that just because it works doesn't mean it's always the best solution. And this is probably something, especially if you're savvy, you figured out through your life, right? You figured out that, oh yeah, if I implement that, that might save time or that might be the result. But ultimately, is that going to be sustainable? And that's a really good question for extroverted thinking. And savvy extroverted thinking people, probably you listening, if you're extroverted thinking, if you hear a marketing message that also indicates the sustainability of something, aha, they probably have this dialed in because they're bringing a sustainability message underneath it all. I think that's really key here. And when you're communicating to extroverted thinking, it's not just about what works, not just about showing the before and after, but also communicating the sustainability, the ultimate effectiveness of what they're going to get from your product or service or your creation, not just the immediate result. That makes sense? Because I think, I think that can be something that can really gum up the works, especially for extroverted thinking. So in the language you use to talk to extroverted thinking, a lot of the words you'll say is, this will work, this is the result, sustainability, effectiveness, this will make you do things efficiently. A lot of it is around resource management, about time management, timelines, getting things done, getting things accomplished, feeling complete, and moving things to completion. This is a lot of what resonates or what really makes sense to an extroverted thinking person. So let's talk about, so that's some of the language you'd use. Let's talk about extroverted feeling. So extroverted feeling is the mental process of the decision-making function used by all FJs in the Myers-Briggs system. So INFJs, ENFJs, ISFJs, ESFJs. This is a, a strength for them in how they make decisions. And what extroverted feeling is looking for, the criteria they're looking for, is the question, what gets everybody's needs met? What gets the needs met about the peop- of the people around me that keeps harmony? In fact, that's the nickname we have for this cognitive function here at Personality Hacker is harmony because it's really dialed in on keeping discord at bay, keeping harmony among people going. And that's, that comes down to meeting needs around you. If people have their needs met, extroverted feeling just knows inherently that it's going to lead to happy people, connected people, people that can get along with each other. It's going to create a harmonious environment if people feel good and if they've got all of their needs attended to. This is what harmony is dialed in on and extroverted feeling is dialed in on. Yeah. So if that matchmaking advertisement is a is almost like a prototypical extroverted thinking advertisement, I always think of cleaning and cooking solutions on TV as the extroverted feeling sort of stereotypical or prototypical advertisement. Like uh, I think of uh, the old hamburger helper advertisements that basically indicated that mom could get dinner done really fast so the family could eat together. And they would show at the end of the commercial, like everybody's super happy and, you know, like eating as a family together and everybody felt good. Or uh, there's a, uh, was it a Swiffer commercial? I can't remember, but it was a dad talking about how he wanted to spend more time with his son relaxing and they called it deep couch sitting. And, but the problem was, is that his son kept running in with muddy shoes. And so this was the tool or the solution to be able to deal with the muddy shoe problem on the hardwood floor so that the two of them could spend more time together. So there's always this, there's a result for extroverted feeling that they're looking for too, but the result is that everybody feels good. It's high morale. Everybody's getting their needs met and including the the person who's going to be buying the product, right? The mom or the dad. And they all just feel really good about that. Or car commercials that focus more on safety standards than on, you know, sleek performance. The, the performance standards are usually trying to talk to people who have extroverted feeling because they want to make sure that their whole family is going to be okay and safe. So extroverted feeling is, there's like a slight nuance between the difference of extroverted thinking and extroverted feeling. Extroverted thinking is more about getting a specific result, like, and, and the result is individual to the person. And they just need to know that it's going to make their life easier, like uh, in time and efficiency and get goal orientation. Whereas extroverted feeling, it's about getting your life uh, or making your life easier in getting your family's needs met, which are never ending. So extroverted thinking is actually trying to do time efficiency. They're looking for tools that are that will free up their time for other pursuits. And extroverted f- thinking, excuse me, extroverted feeling is looking for things that will make the never ending list of needs 
that you have to constantly be responsive to to help you dance that dance. Yeah. So it's a difference where right? one is about time efficiency and resource efficiency and the other one is about knowing that you're going to be constantly responsive to the needs of other people. So how do you make it so that you can you can do that and not get overwhelmed? And really smart marketing messages when they're talking to extroverted feeling take into account the need that the person that uses this as a judging function has to meet the need of and also meet the need of the person that is getting the needs met. So let me explain what I just meant by that because that seems really abstract. (laughs) So the mom that buys the cereal, the breakfast cereal, let's say, using extroverted feeling, she knows this breakfast cereal will get the need met of the child if it tastes good because the child doesn't care if the nutrients are there. The child doesn't care what is in it substantively, substantively, that's a hard word to say, They only care if it tastes good or not. That's what the child is interested in. So mom wants something that tastes good. And then the the really smart marketer says, oh, and it's also good for little Johnny too. So it gets mom's need met of making sure she is giving him a healthy, nutritious breakfast. So there's a little bit of a double layer here with extroverted feeling. And that getting your own needs met as an extroverted feeling person is also something marketers dial into as well. You ever heard the message like, you know, at, and again, a lot of this is targeted to moms because women make up 50, 50% of women are, use this as one of their judging functions, as one of their decision-making functions. It's the highest demographic of any of these functions being used by a particular gender. And women have at least 50% of them either as a first or secondary position in what we call the car model. You can Google or you can search that on our website to know what the heck the car model is if you're a new listener. A lot of information around that. It's a great tool for you to use as a framework. But just know that the message like, you know, mom, you've been really struggling with the kids all day. Don't you deserve a nice relaxing bath with this drink or this product or this bath salt? It's getting needs met again, but it's their own needs that it's focused on this time. You've been meeting everybody else's needs, mom. You've been working really hard to meet the needs of your family. Don't you deserve a break? Don't you deserve the chance to meet your own needs? You see these messages a lot coming in for extroverted feeling types. Yeah, I would say that the most effective marketing in that though is everybody else got their needs met first and yours is the cherry on top. So the thing that our product solves is that you're always getting everybody else's need met and our our product allows you to get your needs met too. So it becomes a sort of added incentive. I also think that because extroverted feeling is so in touch with morale and people's general f- feeling of happiness, a lot of marketing messages that aren't maybe necessarily directed towards mom, but more directed towards like a sense of collaboration or friends together or people doing activities together or anything where you've got a group of people whose morale is high. That's oftentimes appealing to the extroverted feeling part of us. So you could have an advertisement for, I mean, you know, like anything that helps facilitates good times like food or beverages or like, you know, even a beer commercial could actually be appealing to the extroverted feeling part of us. If like everybody gets together around a campfire and a beach and they're all like super happy and they're all like kicking back with Coronas or something that appeals to that part of who we are because it's the, it's the, we all get together as friends and we all get a boost morale together and we all get to engage in this moment together. So extroverted feeling isn't just towards mom, although that's the stereotype of the advertisement. It's, Anything that shows that everybody's going to win. Whenever you have language of everybody winning, good times, everybody feels good, get your needs met, feel like happy. Anytime you've got morale boosting messages, it is generally appealing to that extroverted feeling process. Can you already see a pattern emerging that if you're crafting a message toward, let's say, extroverted feeling, how other types would go, oh, they almost be icked out by it. The better you do a job, like if you're communicating something, whether it's marketing for a product or service, or if you're a nonprofit trying to get donations and you do it in a particular way, part of that power is you're dialed into the audience that you're communicating to, but also part of that is you're basically polarizing the people that don't see it that way often. Well, and the same would apply for extroverted thinking. Absolutely. Like I see car commercials or watch commercials that are dialing into a status piece that I find to be a bit of a turnoff. But then I realize, well, this is there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing bad or wrong with appealing to people's desire to, you know, hold influence through objects. And yet it kind of turns me off a little bit. And and I believe that it is a very targeted message to its intended audience and they and it does a very good job. Same thing with extroverted feeling, right? And and I could see this pattern holding through for the other functions. So if you're marketing somebody using extroverted feeling, a lot of lang- a lot of the language will be around, you know, just 
does this get needs met? Does this solve the happiness problem? A lot of it is about connection, collaboration, you know, shared values, shared experiences. A lot of this is, again, people, relational type things when you're talking about extroverted feelings. So those are just some things to think about. If you're, the, if you're using this tool to market to people or to talk to people or to influence people or persuade people using extroverted feeling, these are the types of language you'd use. Well, and just like you mentioned with extroverted thinking, like a person might get marketed towards the efficiency piece of it, but it's not sustainable. The same thing if you are on the consuming end and you are using extroverted feeling, there's a lot of messages out there that talk about how all of you are going to have such a great time or it's going to get your needs met that may or may not be accurate. Like hamburger helper may not be the best meal to give to your your family. (laughs) Like there might be more nutritious options out there. And so when you're being marketed to, don't just ask what will get your needs met in the moment, right? Your family's needs met in the moment quickly, but actually over time, just like with extroverted thinking, you want to look for sustainable solutions and the same thing happens it's long-term getting people's needs met so let's move to introverted feeling so this is the decision-making process uh, used by all the fp types so infp enfp isfp esfp use this as their primary way of making decisions and introverted feeling is the you know it's not extroverted feeling it's introverted basically it's all the things that you feel on the inside of yourself so the core values the inner alignment, the actual deeper desires and the resonance of something to you. And at, when we talk about introverted feeling and we're going to get ready to talk about introverted thinking, these are, these are not as, uh, as obvious, I think, for a lot of people with marketing messages. Now, introverted feeling is probably the decision-making function that a lot of people that are in the marketing world use to create marketing messages. A lot of people at ad agencies and a lot of people at marketing agencies a lot of people that are attracted to this end of things. I mean, I'm extremely attracted to marketing and I use introverted feeling as my process. I think it, it tends to attract those people as the ones creating the message. So sometimes messages are created by introverted feeling for other types. And you can sometimes see that in advertisements or marketing messages. But introverted feeling wants to know what resonates and, and really what will allow me to express myself in my true authentic nature as a person. So your product, your service, your mission, your nonprofit, your cause, whatever you're trying to persuade me to do has to resonate at a core level of what my actual desires are and who I see myself being in the world and how I see myself expressing in the world. Yeah, the the challenges or problems that the introverted processes, like introverted feeling and introverted thinking, the challenges that they're trying to solve are, like we mentioned, they're internal. They're all about how we feel about ourselves or our identity. So it's a little more difficult to market to these styles than the extroverted styles, like extroverted feeling and extroverted thinking, because all you have to do is point to a result. Look, here's the thing that will happen if you get this product and you point to it and you can see it and it's in the outside world. But extrovert, I mean, introverted processes are more about solving challenges that dwell within us. So one of the things about introverted feeling, like you mentioned, a lot of people in advertising and marketing are people who use this process. So it's a little easier for them to tap into that. But it's a lot more about identity and individuality. Like the Dr. Pepper commercial that is all about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm unique. I stand out from the crowd. I'm a pepper. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be me. That's all like really targeted towards that introverted feeling process. Anytime an advertiser or marketer is effectively calling you out as different than everybody else, that's like dog whistle, right, to that introverted feeling part of you that acknowledges that you are not like everyone else and you're going to have very unique challenges or problems. And so when they talk to just you and they mention you as like, and when I say you, I mean, they're, t- they're saying this to millions of people ostensibly in a commercial or, you know, to the hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands, whatever their reach is. They're saying, hey, you're not like everybody else, are you? you? You march to the beat of your own drum. So the product that we have acknowledges that and it's tailored for you. You're the person who we're looking for. And it feels very personal. The messaging to introverted feeling is very one-to-one. Even if it's, even if it's a blast to millions, it's still intended to feel very intimate and one-to-one and acknowledging you are not like everybody else. And yeah, a lot of times, this is a way for you to express who you are. I think a good company or excuse me, a company that does this well, I don't, I don't want to put a value to good or bad on the company themselves, but I think a company that markets to this 
individually expressing yourself very well. And obviously it goes outside of just people that use this function, but I think Apple does this really well. They say, if you have an iPhone and you know, remember you know, 10 years ago, they had that earbud kind of symbology where you had the little white earbuds coming up and the advertisements. And it was this idea of you're expressing yourself individually by having a really unique product that you have. And that says something about you as a person. If you've got this product and you're walking around with it, people are going to notice that you're different, you're unique, and you're special. And that's really the marketing they dialed in on. And they said that to you, you know, you're going to be special and unique. That was really trying to tap into that introverted feeling part and say that that's going to be a way for you to showcase your individuality. And so I think a lot of the marketing messages here, if you're trying to talk to the FP crowd or the introverted feeling crowd, basically you want to couch things in a way of allowing them to take it and make it their own, allow them to utilize this to express themselves in certain ways. So a lot about individuality, a lot of language about showcasing your unique self, individuality. You're not just one of the crowd, you're special, you're unique. This product service, this cause, this social endeavor, whatever it is, will help you really express the true desires of your heart, the true inner alignment and the resonance of your heart and the way that you really show up to the world. And I think people using this function that get marketed to that way respond well. And again, there's always some things that can kind of go off the rails or be, you know, obviously this, this, the person using this has a sniffer detector to sniff out inauthenticity, right? Because their, their metric is what is authentic, what's not. And in fact, I would say both of the introverted functions you know, both introverted feeling and what we're about ready to talk about introverted thinking are resistant to marketing because they have so much of a sniffer. They know what's just trying to point to something outside themselves. It's so subjective of what you're trying to tell them that even if it is a good product or service, and this is, I think, where it can go off, even if it's something that they really want, it has to sometimes be packaged in just the right way or they'll resist it just out of principle because it's so much a part of how, you know, I'm one of these two, I use introverted feeling, how we see ourselves we don't want to be deceived, to be tricked, to do something that everybody else is doing. We want to make sure that we're really unique. And so I think that's one thing when you're marketing to this crowd or this group, the people that use this function, you have to be authentic. You can't be incongruent with the message, the resonance of what that is. They're going to be able to sniff it out and be able to tell out of the gate when that comes down the pike. Yeah. And if you are using this process, some one of the challenges is that if a person just happens to package things exactly the way that you need to hear the message to make you feel like you are totally unique, you might end up creating a desire for the product that you don't really want <laughs> just because the marketing was so good. And I actually think that this is the large majority of why people get very suspicious of marketing because they know that this is how it works, is that if the, if the message is crafted well enough, then all of a sudden you have a desire for a product that is not right for you. So you kind of have to be you know, you have to be a little bit savvy. And I, I wouldn't say cynical, though. I don't think cynical is the right word. I don't I don't believe that people should be cynical about marketing. In fact, in the last podcast, we mentioned that, you know, if you're if you have icky feelings about marketing, it's probably you not having a fully calibrated willpower <laughs> or understanding your will completely. So when I say you need to be savvy, I, I want to make sure that I'm not indicating a cynicism necessarily, but you do have to be savvy to recognizing that people can market directly to to your language, the language of your mind, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the product that they're advertising is right for you, but it does mean that they got pretty good at understanding how you think, so maybe that product is right for you because they got to a point, especially if you can sniff out whether or not their marketing is in alignment with their passion for a product then oftentimes, you know, that, that check into it and see if it's a match for you. But the marketing piece is just to get your attention. And so that's oftentimes how people try to get introverted feelings attention is by talking about individuality and uniqueness. So the final four of the judging or decision making processes is introverted thinking. And we, we've nicknamed it accuracy and it's the d decision making or judging process of all of the TPs in the Myers-Briggs system. So INTPs, ENTPs, ISTPs, and ESTPs. And introverted thinking fundamentally asks the question of what makes sense. And this is a very subjective question. What makes sense is very individualized to the person and whatever information is inside their head and whatever reality that they're living in. So this is just like introverted feeling in the sense that 
you are you are trying to reach somebody whose ultimate evaluative criteria is very subjective. It's very subjective to them. And I've noticed that really quite few marketers enter the territory of introverted thinking. I think the reason why is because introverted feeling is also sticky. It's also difficult to market to, but a lot of people in marketing are using that process. So it's a little more natural for them to craft messages that will speak to that process. But I don't see the humongous numbers of people in the marketing industry that use introverted thinking, some, but but not nearly in the, in the same numbers. And so Introverted thinking is fussy. It's a very small percentage of the population that uses it. And it has a tendency to, uh, to, well, there's not a lot of people in marketing using it. So they don't necessarily know how to market to this process. And I, of course, I'm speaking as if everybody's aware of these processes to begin with, which is not accurate either. But we kind of get a sense to who we're talking to. And if we're good at psychology, we work some of this out, even without having to have a specific model. But introverted thinking is generally the process that gets marketed to when we're talking about sleek tools. And the reason why, even though it's asking what makes sense, is that introverted thinking is always looking for leverage points in the outside world. It wants tools and uh, and things that will help facilitate it getting uh, something like achievement oriented and to be able to actually glean even more information or data. So the, the majority of the marketing that gets done to people of this type are actually in tech industries. That's generally, that's sort of the prototypical advertisement for introverted thinking is like a, a you know, like some sort of like technical Um, Not necessarily general consumer tech, like not like a smartphone necessarily, but more like Alienware or something that like instruments, a lot of instruments, um, you know, especially really high end instruments are being marketed to people who use introverted thinking, Um, like guitars, like fenders and that kind of thing. And the reason why is because they're trying to get you to like basically get as much information as humanly possible in order to make this the best choice. And that's what introverted thinking does. When it chooses something to buy and it asks what makes sense, it's calling as much data as it can to find the absolute optimized end result instrument or tool. And I know that I do this like crazy. Before we were talking about a piece of marketing that spoke to me and I watched a sales video and at the end of the sales video, I got my credit card out (laughs) and actually I didn't buy immediately. What's interesting is that after I watched the sales video, I went to a couple of consumer sites that reviewed it. And one of the consumer sites reviewed it and gave it a negative review based on a price point that was no longer relevant because the product had dropped by 50%. And so one of their arguments was you could you could actually get everything that they're saying would come in one package. You can part it out and get it in multiple different sources for a cheaper price. But then I looked at the price and realized that it had dropped by 50%. It used to be like $100, but now it's $50. And then I went and priced all of those individual components and realized it was like an $8 differential. So I could, instead of spending my time and effort buying all of these different products from different places, I could just buy this one product at this one place and it was like eight bucks different, which difference, which totally made sense to me, right? That like, why would I spend all my time and effort for eight bucks. That's not worth it. So I just went ahead and bought this one after a review. And the review is like, it works. It's great. Like there's a lot of good things about it. It's just overpriced. Well, it wasn't overpriced anymore. So I not only was I very impressed with the sales video, which gave me a crap ton of information I didn't have before. And that was probably the thing that sold me more than anything else is that they taught me something new, something I didn't understand. And not just about the product, but about the thing the product was addressing. They gave me an overall holistic picture of like a whole world that I wasn't really that tapped into. So they gave me almost like a zoom out education and then zoomed in and said, here's how this product fits with all of this. And so like that was super impressive to me, all the information they gave me. And then when I did my own research, I discovered the price point was much better than it had been, you know, before when it was reviewed and was positive. So it was a no brainer for me. I think a lot of introverted thinking goes through that same process that when we're advertising to this product, um, to, to this mental process, we want to make sure that we add as much information as we can about not just necessarily the product itself, but how it fits into a bigger spectrum, give some framework and context for why this thing exists. One of the most solid advertisements for advertising to introverted thinking in instruments is like a history of how 
like the instrument came to be or like what were the great instruments of the past and how they relate to the current instrument that you're looking at. Yeah. It's like a lot of data and information. And then the second piece is, uh, I think that really appeals to introverted thinking is sleekness. I remember these uh, Alienware laptop commercials where they didn't say much. They just allowed the, the um, camera to pan around the sleekness of the uh, of the laptop and all of its features and then once it did that then it gave you some specs and it was a combination of the sleekness of the design like how good a design it was combined with the specs that was like to introverted thinking I mean a lot of the TPs I know want an Alienware laptop (laughs) like that's their that's you know like the the $2,500 gaming machine dream um, in a laptop so when you're when you're speaking to this this function, the the two components that you really want to speak to is beauty of design, sleekness of design, where it's really well done, combined with a lot of information, yeah. information that might seem un, you know unnecessary to other types, but to introverted thinking, it's like you know what you're talking about. So I'm going to add credibility to you. Might not be describing the challenge, you might just just be describing a holistic environment. But I know that I can trust you because you're giving me a bunch of information I didn't know before. So now I'm giving you credibility on the product too because you clearly know your stuff. If you contrast this with extroverted thinking, remember extroverted thinking is looking for the result. It actually doesn't care that much. I mean, it cares to some degree about the process to get to the result. But often it's more interested in the results and the process. I would say you flip that. With introverted thinking, it's much more process focused. So it wants to know how the result was derived. How did you get to the result you got? And is that the best way to do it? Was that the optimized, like, did it make sense? Was it the optimized way of getting to the result you got? And what I'm interested in as a TP or as an introverted thinking person, I'm speaking on behalf of this person, they'd be saying to you, I'm interested in all the precision elements that go through this. That's why the history of the creation of the product or its evolution is important, all the components that went into it. Is this a well-crafted machine? Is the process behind it thoughtful? Was there a lot of thought put in the process? Because I know, you know, as a, speaking from an introverted thinking person standpoint, they're going to say, I know how to get the result I want. I need the right tool for the job. I need my tool to be optimized because I'm not exactly sure what result I want totally yet. I need this tool to be, to be able to be applied to any result I might want it for. So that Alienware computer, it's not so much about what specific game it can run. It needs to be able to run any game that I might want to play at any time or somebody else that's using it might want to play at any time. Yeah, just to piggyback off of that is this uh, idea that for introverted thinking, they give you the most trust when you give them information without necessarily asking for anything in return, which is a hard thing to do in marketing. And you kind of like, that's not really something that you can completely do, but you kind of have to give that feel (laughs) like we know you're gonna, you're at a process of, if you're looking for a single product, you are at, you are midstream, early, mid or late stream in your, in your investigative process, because you're not going to just buy something most of the time. You're going to go vet it and you're going to go see what other people think about it. Like there's going to be a lot of information gathered. So we're going to be the source of the information for you. Like we want to be the major source. I ended up buying you a djembe drum for Christmas a few years ago. And the website I bought it through was the website that had the most comprehensive series of YouTube videos to tell me how djembe drums were used, how to know a good high, high quality one. There were other djembe drums online that were cheaper. But this site, I trusted because they gave me the history and an understanding and awareness of djembe drums that I didn't know. So I actually spent more money on the drum because I thought this is going to be a high quality one because these people know their stuff. So there's like this sense of, you know, your introverted thinking. There's other types that do a lot of investigation. Like, you know, I most introverts, especially introvert thinkers like I, ITJs will do a lot of investigating as well. But I think the assumption with um, introverted thinking is that like th- there's very rarely an elegant solution. So I need you to explain to me why this is an elegant solution. I need all the information to to you know to to give me that piece, and I'm looking for the best tools possible. I got sold on a you know speaking as a woman who's a TP. There's a lot of you know household chore tools out there 
that are actually advertised to people who are FJs, since FJs make up the majority, like 50% of women. One out of two women is an FJ. So a lot of advertising to women and women-oriented things ends up being advertising specifically to you know extroverted feeling. And I'm introverted thinking. I've got a little FE in me or a little extroverted feeling in me as my tertiary or 10-year-old process. But the majority of the time, I'm looking at introverted thinking um, to make my final call. And it's it's actually the polarity of the two. It's like kind of like a back and forth between those two that really helps me make the decision. And I got sold on a, a relatively expensive tool that is a combination of a steam cleaner and a vacuum cleaner at the same time. And I went and did a bunch of research on the best one, but I basically got sold on this product because uh, there was a there was a website that gave me a ton of information on how this works and why this is something that has not really been able to be available before because they've just figured out some pieces of the technology and here's how it works, et cetera. And I went out and threw down good money because this was going to make my life a lot easier in household chores. I hate doing household chores. It's really obnoxious. And so one tool takes out two problems for me when it comes to the hardwood floors. It's like a vacuum cleaner and a steam cleaner at the same time. And I was like, dude, this is a no brainer. This is super elegant. This is like a problem solving a problem that makes me not have to think about it. And I found it on a website that gave me a lot of information. So it's like those kinds of things are the sweet spot for introverted thinking. You're solving a problem. You're doing elegantly. You give a lot of information. And then the person just kind of goes, it makes sense. I can't not get it. Yeah. I want to mention this idea of you were talking about that one product where the person made a comment, a negative comment where, you know, for half the cost, you could go get these component parts of this and just string it together yourself. And that makes more sense, right? That's kind of what the person was being critical about. Yeah. They're basically showing you, you could go and do this on your own Mm -hmm. and get this all individually and create the product basically with all these ingredients or all these components on your own terms. And I think that's where the, you know, we've talked about kind of the negative or the downside of each one of these or the overcompensation for these could be. And I think this is where the introverted thinking's compensation is, is Oh, I could do this on my own. And instead of buying the product or services being advertised to them, they go out and they try to piece together elements of that on their own. And there's two things I'll say to that. One is you might be able to do that. You might be able to do it cheaper and better on your own. Like like when I say better, I don't mean necessarily quality of product. I just mean like you could get it less expensive. It will take some time to do that though. And the other thing is if the if the product again, I'm going back to this model of a of a creator that is creating something and then selling it or pushing it out to a market or, or persuading you to invest in it, if you like the stuff that they're doing, and it's maybe just a little bit of a markup, as an introverted thinking person, it's okay. It makes sense to support people that are doing good work. Like It doesn't make sense for you to go to do it on your own because you're robbing somebody that this is their mission in life or this is what they're doing in life. So it makes sense for you to help support the art, the creations, the products, the services that maybe... Yeah, you could do it on your own. Yeah, that's possible. But why not be supportive of people that that's what they do for a living, right? You have something you do for a living that people support you in. So that's just something to think about for introverted thinking, I think. Oh, absolutely. And I, I again, it's like that sustainability thing, right? Like in, in that case, it's not necessarily sustaining you. It's sustaining a source of information that is becoming valuable to you. So you're creating more sustainability that way. And I've gotten to a point, I think it's, I think that whole slapdash put everything together, you know, because it's cheaper piece has become less and less persuasive to me with introverted thinking because I'm valuing my time so much more. I'm like, if it was twice the cost, in this particular situation for me, if it had been literally twice the cost of going and putting it together myself, I could understand why I might make that choice if I couldn't afford that 100% markup. But uh, they made the price more reasonable, probably because of feedback that they had gotten. And, um, And also like it was still more expensive. It was still more expensive to buy the one thing than to go piece it together myself, but not to a point where it would make sense for me to go do all the labor of it and the time and the effort. Yeah. So I think you also, using introverted thinking, you're not as good necessarily at understanding outer world metrics as extroverted thinking is, but you do get to a point where you start to value things like time better. And an elegant solution will be more persuasive because it just kind of fits all these different criteria. So it's a matter of going like, yeah, I could go do that on my own, but how much am I valuing my time? <laughs> Should I just go ahead and hand over money to somebody who's already figured this all out? And and I think that that's, that's something that I had to grow into. And, I, and just so if you're tracking, I said there were two things I wanted to mention, and Tony just said the second thing. So 
that was what I was going to say is that it also sometimes doesn't make sense to put so much time into something when you can already have it assembled for you already created in its full entity rather than having to piece it together. I think that's, that's a piece that, you know, supposedly should make sense. So in marketing, you're going to use words like this makes sense. You're going to use words of like accuracy of leverage, precision, leverage, precision, tool, optimize, optimize things of that nature. And the other thing is, I think with, you know, if I'm going to sit down and I'm going to have a message crafted to someone who uses introverted thinking, they're going to do the research anyway. So in the messaging, it would be good for me to provide the links or the resources or the, or the tools for them to get quicker access to that resource. So not only am I, I'm persuading them to invest in the product or service or cause that I'm proposing, but I'm helping facilitate their, their research as well. And I'm being very blatant about it, even referencing things that are not on my website, for example, or not the thing that I'm creating. Hey, there's, here are the other five competitors maybe that create something similar. And here's what I like and don't like about them. And here, go do research on your own and provide that for them in a lot of ways. And I think also what I just said about, yeah, you could, do, you could literally say this in your marketing. You could say, yeah, you could go string all this together on your own, but... We're here. We care about people. We want to do this for, you know, for people. It saves you time. Wouldn't it make sense to support people who want to put effort into this and create something of value? So this idea of helping make a case to go ahead and invest in something that, yeah, it's a little bit maybe more or or different or whatever, as long as it really is optimized. It can't be a crappy product or service. It has to actually do what you say it does and have the precision. But the piece of the components, I think, could be just called in the marketing, say, yeah, you could component this together, but isn't it better it's already done here? And you're also supporting a good cause because this is the the art or the creation or the creativity I'm bringing to the world or, or our, our organization is bringing to the world. Yeah. As a polarity to extroverted feeling, just like extroverted feeling is trying to get everybody's needs met, introverted thinking is trying to get all the criteria met. It's trying to get all of like like all the things that are important to you as a person. So, you know, supporting good causes and you know, getting all the information and all of that stuff. Like you're trying to make sure that the person's criteria is met. And a lot of, for a lot of introverted thinking, I, I've noticed personally that uh, I know quite a few INTPs that will spend more money on something that came from, uh, you know, a source that they trust and that they've built credibility with. They will, they will go ahead and spend more money because they're grateful to the service the person provided of giving them information. So I do think that that relationship ends up getting established. And support things that matter, right? Yeah. I mean, I think I, I see that a lot. We spent a lot of time in introverted thinking. And I think one of the reasons, first of all, you were, the one, <laughs> you were the one talking about it and you tend to like to really give all the data, right? As an introverted thinking person. But also this is one of the challenging cognitive function, people that use this cognitive function, this mental process to make decisions. If you're a marketer, they can sniff out that incongruity between the maker of the product service or cause and the message. They're, they're probably some of the best at really digging into some of the nuances there and and the bullshit meter is high with this one. If I want to use Star Wars terms, right? Yeah. <laughs> like to use the grammatical structure of Star Wars. Like if you're introverted thinking, your bullshit meter is high. You get a sense of what is bullshit and what's not. So it's a very tricky way to communicate. And it means you have to be real. You've got to be accurate. You've got to be precise. You can't try to snow or deceive anybody. You have to be truthful with your messages. I believe that's with everybody. That's my personal ethic is you got to be truthful with your messages merge the marketing message with the actual creation process, make it integral to both things. Don't be smarmy. It, but what I'm saying is, if you're another type, you might be able to be misled easier than introverted thinking. Now, there's probably elements of introverted thinking that could be misled as well. But that's oh, yeah. why we spent a lot of time on this one is because it's one that, you know, if you're getting messages out, it can be a sometimes a difficult group of people to communicate with effectively especially if you don't have this as part of your wiring. Yeah, I would say, I would argue that they're, we're the, some of the toughest to market to. Yeah. Be and, and not because we are we have like greater willpower than other types, but just because it's so rare for people to speak our language. Yeah. And so uh, it, it's, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a more difficult, nuanced one to market to. So this is a podcast with, uh, I mean, a really high level overview. Obviously, you can find some videos of us giving talks about this online if you Google it. Uh, you can also see the program, Rapid Customer Report, where we, we do dive deeper into this. Like we go into more of the specifics and give examples of commercials and advertisements and all that in that program. But I think this gives you a good sense of the different types of people and how they make decisions and their relationship to marketing messages 
and communication messages. And this is the second in kind of like a an unofficial series of three different podcasts. We just kind of up on the, in the fly on the first podcast went, we should break this up into multiples. <laughs> and then later on, I was like, we should also do one on money. So this is the second podcast. And the next podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about people's relationship with money because we, we discussed it in the last podcast about people's relationship with marketing and how there's almost like a sense of growing hostility towards anything that is attempting to be sold. And yet at the same time, if there is no marketing, there's like literally no economy. There's no way for us to actually have jobs. Um, and so it really comes down to people's relationship with with money and what's going on for them when it comes to money. So in the next podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about the psychology of money and the psychology of, of why we have some uh, like certain senses of hostility around this. But um, in the meantime, what do you guys think? Yeah. Well, you're, you're going to take that and you're like, oh, maybe that's Joel's job. That, I don't know. That's totally Joel's job. I was going to go, what do you guys think? Come back to Personality Hacker and tell us. And then I was like, oh, I'm totally doing jo- Joel's job. I don't give two craps about you guys. I care about you listening. The one person right now I'm talking to, I don't care about an audience out there. What do you think? You listening, you've had your headphones in, you've been in your car, maybe you've been on a jog or run in your car listening to us. We want to hear from you. Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this podcast. Leave us a comment ask a question. Let's discuss with other people in the community. Let's have a conversation around this idea of marketing and how the different types maybe respond to different marketings. And I think this could be a really interesting conversation. You can also join our community of like minds, people just like you over at facebook.com forward slash personality hacker or twitter.com forward slash personality hack, H-A-C-K. See, that's why you're better at it is because you remember that we're talking to one person and I say things like you guys. (laughs) <laughs> That's why you're so much better. And and I think it's really important to remember that we're we're we ha- are an intimate experience talking to one person at a time. So I love that you always remember that. If you enjoy this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. And if you're feeling particularly generous, you can leave us a rating or review on iTunes. That helps us out a lot. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. Mm-hmm.